I'm not a confident man. But when I was a kid, there was one thing that made me feel strong, powerful. That one thing? A good instruction manual. Like Mozart composing his requiem, or Van Gogh painting his portrait, such was the elegance of me following the instructions while assembling a piece of Ikea furniture. How it all fit together. How uncertainty, while looking at a pile of screws, became certainty when unfolding the included diagram. If only my life came with instructions. If only I didn't have to grope in the dark, failing to figure out how all the pieces of my existence were supposed to fit together. For the longest time, I was convinced my instruction manual was out there. I just needed to find it. This is why, in my early 20s, I ended up attending a weekend self-improvement seminar in a hotel ballroom in suburban New Jersey. Signing up for this thing, I couldn't part with my 1200 bucks fast enough. I was so convinced I would walk away with all the answers. When the weekend was over, I realized I'd made a big mistake. That story, later this episode. I'm David Sajan. I'm a loser, hosting a podcast about losers. Presidential candidates who ran but never won. Today's episode is about a man who came with all the right instructions, or so he thought. He recognized something broken, not in himself, but in his country, America. And he spent much of his life forging the tools to fix this broken nation, heal its divisions, and elevate its people. But the more he tried to fix the country, the more it broke. Like a doctor whose cure only made the patient sicker, it seemed like every tool this man used drove the country further apart. This is the story of a man who ran for president and lost so bad, the loss arguably killed him. This is the story of either misunderstood genius or passionate folly. This is the story of Horace Greeley. The first thing you need to know about Horace Greeley, the man was absolutely, without a doubt, not a politician. This became crystal clear when he got to Congress in December 1848. I don't know how anybody expected anything other than what happened. This is Jake Lundberg. I teach history at uh, the University of Notre Dame. I also direct the uh, undergraduate program in history here. He's the author of Horace Greeley, Print, Politics, and the Failure of American Nationhood. And there's a quote from that book which I love. Few people in the whole history of Congress made themselves so unwelcome in so short a time. Yeah. <laughs> Unpack that. He go he goes to Congress and what happens? So he just you know immediately raised a ruckus. One one newspaper description that I found is what said Horace Greeley bangs into that body like a sledgehammer. That body? The US House of Representatives. Greeley had friends in high places, and he was a loyal member of the Whig political party. So when a New York congressman was removed from his office for election fraud, Whig party insiders chose Greeley to serve out the remainder of that congressman's term, which was three months. When Greeley walked into the House in December 1848, people noticed because Greeley was famous, really famous, not for being a politician, but for his day job newspaper editor. That's, that kind of gets at part of the problem, is that he is this person with this outsized reputation. You know, it may be too much to say that he has no idea how the place actually works, but if he does, he has no respect for how the place actually works, and in fact has contempt for how it works. And so here he is, this guy with this, with this huge reputation, you know, more well-known, more famous than most of the people there, and he is calling them out for being lazy and corrupt in all of these different ways. And how was Congress lazy and corrupt, according to Greeley? You know, you all take breaks that are too long. You know, people are socializing and drinking in the cloakrooms. People are having a good time and taking it easy. And here's this guy who's, who's saying, you know, you're not following the rules. You know, there's a little bit of a hall monitor quality to the whole, to the whole thing. You and I might fantasize about lecturing Congress for taking too many breaks, but this kind of nitpicking, while irritating, wasn't what made Greeley so unwelcome. What really pissed off Congress was Greeley going after their money. At this time in 1848, congressmen were paid $8 a day, or 40 cents a mile, 
while traveling to and from the Capitol, Washington, D.C. And while traveling, they were expected to take the, quote, usually traveled route. The quote-unquote usually traveled route was just vague enough for congressmen to take or to more likely just report unnecessarily long routes to and from Washington and get paid extra money. When Greeley saw this, he did what any self-righteous hall monitor would do. He snitched. And because he ran one of the most influential newspapers in the country, the New York Tribune, he had a hell of a megaphone. He had the Tribune publish this massive expose revealing um, all of these ex- excessive reimbursements taken by the members, um, right down to you know the dollars and cents. Even his fellow Whigs got named in this expose. Even Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe, who was an Illinois congressman at the time, he got called out for excessive mileage reimbursements of almost $700. That's about 25 grand in today's dollars. When Greeley exposed Congress in his own newspaper, it was a pretty big deal. This is a very singular thing for him to um, be a presence within Congress and then also to be able to take this incredibly influential, almost nationally circulating newspaper and kind of bolster his argument with what goes into that, what goes into that newspaper. It would be like the owner of a cable news network going to Congress. Right, exactly. Exactly. Or like the only congressman with a Twitter account. Right. Like nobody else <laughs> no nobody else has one except for this one person. What he's up to when he's in Congress is this effort at creating this kind of national framework. This is a moment when Congress is bitterly divided as the country is becoming increasingly bitterly divided over the issue of slavery and the spread of slavery into Western territories. He's trying to make Congress into a a kind of national institution. Greeley is trying to fix what he sees as a broken Congress, to forge it into a tool for national unity. This same impulse would lead to Greeley running for president 24 years later in 1872. But much like the voters in 1872, Congress in 1848 wasn't buying the kind of unity Greeley was selling. I mean, when Congress forms a committee to investigate after Greeley publishes his mileage expose, their investigation is more about Greeley's impropriety than their own. In the end, Greeley's calls for reform go nowhere. He serves out the remainder of his three-month term, then hops on a train back to New York City, I imagine, to hushed utterances of good riddance. But he would be back in Washington. Horace Greeley was always and ever on the lookout for the next broken thing to fix. Horace Greeley was born into a poor farming family in rural New Hampshire on February 3, 1811. Growing up, the first object of his sledgehammer, the first thing Greeley was determined to improve, was himself. What I find really interesting about his childhood is the way that he understood it through this lens of of a kind of Benjamin Franklin-esque self-made man story. Benjamin Franklin. You and I know him as one of America's founding fathers and an inventor. But you might not realize how popular he was as a writer. Back in the day, many young men regarded his words as essentially an instruction manual for their own lives. There's almost a movement to get people to read Franklin's autobiography and and consciously model themselves after him. Uh, A pretty common thing, but, you know, Greeley's interesting because he modeled it so directly or followed the model so directly. Greeley was a striver. Greeley believed in virtues. This is Vincent DiGirolamo. I'm a professor of history at Baruch College of the City University of New York, and I am the author of Crying the News, a history of America's newsboys. He'll be helping us tell Greeley's story. You see, according to Benjamin Franklin, real virtue was necessary for a republic to function if you didn't operate in an honest, fair-minded way, uh, looking out for the greater good, not just your own selfish uh, sort of uh, accumulation of wealth, uh, you were no good to anybody. Even his autobiography is pitched in, in these kind of um, moral tales of how to, how to be successful and virtuous. You can almost see Greeley creating himself along the lines of Benjamin Franklin's story as this kind of 
young rootless printer who comes from an impoverished background and then goes to the big city to go and, and, and work in, in newspapers. Growing up, Greeley was peculiar because he preferred reading to farming. When he was 11, he ran away from home to be a printer's apprentice, a job Benjamin Franklin held in his youth. But the printer sent him home, told Greeley he was too young. Four years later, at the age of 15, he did manage to become a printer's apprentice for a small newspaper in Vermont. He spent the next five years learning his craft at a variety of newspapers in New England until he finally decided to go to New York City in 1831. He was 20. I would picture him walking into the city with, you know, the knapsack on the stick. And, and indeed, that's how it was portrayed in the first biography of, of Greeley that came out in 1855. So this sort of young, rootless kid coming into the city to make something of himself. Uh, and he had kind of a, a trademark appearance. I don't know if, if he had developed at this point, but what, what describe what came to be known as his, his look. Yeah, well, he, he, he came to New York City as uh, a kind of disheveled hayseed, and he remained that o- over time. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is that, is that there's kind of a, a studied or deliberate way in which he in which he continues to play this role. He, he, well, he wasn't conventionally a conventionally handsome person. The actor that comes to mind is Adam Driver, a tall, sort of a lanky, gangly guy who, co- who comes to town. I mean, he's a little older than, than really was in his 20s as he first arrived. If you could get a young William Hurt, that's, that's the first thing that came into my mind. Maybe John Lithgow, young, younger John Lithgow. You get the idea. Not a leading man, a character actor. Rumpled clothes, rumpled coat, papers flying out of his pockets, wild hair. He was sort of socially uncouth. Um, People described him as being just sort of an oddball to be around. Almost this mad scientist kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. So this weird mad scientist from the country strides into New York City. He happens to arrive at a time when newspapers are changing. A lot. You see, before... Newspapers were sort of one of two things. One, they were directly associated with a political party, and they existed as a kind of glue for people in a very specific political party community. Or there were newspapers that existed for basically people in in business and commerce. And those newspapers were, were super expensive. A whopping six cents per issue, people. And they were, they were really geared toward a very, very narrow audience. Now, what starts to change, or what, what Greeley is, is sort of present for, is the emergence of a new kind of, of publication. They did not restrict themselves to sort of commercial news and, and high politics, uh, but had you know, human interest stories and crime stories covering sensational trials. So they were entertainments. They're gonna cover events and things that are happening within the city itself, gonna try to kind of capture the daily life of the city and try to make that accessible to as, as many people as possible. Um, And so they were sold for a penny, hence the name The Penny Press. The Penny Press. One-cent newspapers like the New York Sun and the New York Herald were changing the media landscape. As a young man looking to make it big in newspapers, Horace Greeley must have been inspired. He was horrified and outraged. Oh, right. I forgot this was uptight, buzzkill, hall monitor Greeley. Exactly, exactly. He thought that the press should be used to instruct and elevate people rather than simply sort of entertain and titillate them. The thing about moralizers, you can't help but wonder if they're for real or if they're pointing the finger at others to keep people from noticing their own shortcomings. Well, it appears Greeley actually practiced what he preached. He was industrious, working long hours. He didn't smoke or drink. Shortly after he got to New York, and for many years, He stayed at a boarding house where people followed a strict schedule, up by 5 a.m. for morning exercise, and a strict diet, raw vegetables and cold water, no meat, coffee, tea, no sex. Ironically, this boarding house is where he met his future wife, a former schoolteacher named Mary Cheney. In what to his mind was an amoral city like New York, this boarding house was a refuge. 
but he couldn't escape the sensationalism of the new penny press. Greeley wouldn't have been uncommon in in condemning the content of these penny newspapers, and there were plenty of people who did. But what made Greeley a little bit different is that he looked at this and tried to create a kind of popular alternative, cheap and hopefully popular, but not necessarily based on titillating the public. Greeley's editorial vision was of a newspaper as a tool for spanking the public. I mean, elevating the public. This is what motivated him to eventually start the paper which would become his legacy, the New York Tribune. But to understand how a nobody from the country starts a big city newspaper, you have to know Greeley's other motivation. You see, this wasn't just about critiquing sensationalism in the press. There's also the political bent that he's critical of. So the two biggest cheap newspapers, the the New York Sun and the New York Herald, both of them were more aligned with the Democratic Party. And so there wasn't a cheap daily newspaper that was aligned more with the Whig Party, which Greeley was aligned with. The Whig political party. Like many New Englanders at the time, Horace Greeley was a Whig. When he was 23, still fresh off the boat in New York and trying to make a name for himself, Greeley co-founded a weekly literary and political journal called The New Yorker. Sounds familiar, but not the same New Yorker magazine we have today. This New Yorker raised Greeley's profile after it launched in 1834 and caught the eye of a politically connected Whig named Thurlow Weed. Thurlow Weed was also a printer, and he recognized a kindred spirit in fellow Whig, Greeley. So he hired Greeley to make a statewide Whig Party newspaper for the 1838 elections. Today, political parties and campaigns run TV ads. Back then, they made campaign newspapers. Greeley's campaign newspaper was deemed successful because the Whig candidate for governor won that election. So Weed hired Greeley to publish a national Whig paper two years later for the 1840 election. This paper seemed to work out, too. The Whigs swept Congress in the White House in 1840, putting President William Henry Harrison into office. Now, people were paying even more attention to this mad scientist hayseed, Horace Greeley. Okay, was Greeley just a glorified political hack, taking money to promote a political ideology? Well, when it came to the Whigs, Greeley was a true believer. He was against slavery. He agreed with Whig economic policy. Overall, there was a synergy of ideas between the Whigs' nationalist high-mindedness, or if you were a Democrat, the Whigs' arrogant paternalism, and Greeley's own reformist, or perhaps uptight, idealism. Greeley seemed to find his true calling espousing this idealism in newspapers. So he took this near decade of printing experience he'd had in New York, along with the thousand bucks worth of printing equipment he'd amassed, And on April 10th, 1841, the first issue of his legacy, the New York Tribune, rolled off the presses. Greeley's vision for a cheap penny paper, a paper which would elevate rather than titillate the public, was realized. By the end of 1841, the Tribune was well on its way, with a daily circulation of around 15,000 issues and growing. And early on, Greeley sees that... uh, What he wants to do, he doesn't want to just create a New York paper. He doesn't want to just uh, trade punches with with the New York publishers and that he has national aspirations. Those national aspirations still had to contend with New York City. Greeley has a really interesting relationship with New York. He hates it. And that's part of the reason why he continued to walk around the place like he was still a kind of country boy farmer. He hates it because it's dirty and loud and and all that. Dirty and loud and immoral and all of these things. And so, you know, he's always telling people to get out of the city, go west. You might have heard the phrase, go west, young man, encouraging Americans to settle the new territory in the west. Greeley probably didn't coin the phrase, but he's the guy known for popularizing it. So he hates the city. But he absolutely needs the city as a platform to become a national figure. So even though he wasn't the most important newspaper within New York City, he's able to become a kind of nationally important newspaper editor because of New York City and and, and because of a nationally circulating weekly edition of, of the New York Tribune. A national weekly. 
So he introduces the Tribune weekly quite early and takes advantage of railroad technology in order to get his uh, newspaper you know, to other cities in New York, to other uh, surrounding states. And then he takes trips to the, the, the Great Lakes and the Midwest. He was the first publisher to have a Washington correspondent. Throughout the 1840s and 50s, as Greeley's editorial reach continued to broaden, his profile continued to rise. By the time he was taking a sledgehammer to Congress in late 1848 and early 1849, almost everyone in America knew the name Horace Greeley. But whether they said that name with respect or contempt probably said a lot about where you lived and how you felt about slavery. Funny how that topic keeps coming up in these episodes. Throughout the 1850s, the conflict between North and South about slavery is growing, as is the pro-slavery hatred for anti-slavery Yankee Horace Greeley. As you know, this crisis will eventually break the country into pieces. Civil War. Horace Greeley thinks he has the tools and the instructions for putting those pieces back together, which is why he will run for president in the election of 1872. The story of how Greeley will fail after the break. Fade in, a New Jersey parking lot. It's night, and it smells like barbecue. Like I said earlier, I'd come here for a motivational seminar in my early 20s. I was looking for direction, a modern-day version of what Horace Greeley found in Benjamin Franklin's Instructions for Living. My Benjamin Franklin was a tall, muscular, charismatic man in a tight T-shirt with one of those headset microphones, strutting back and forth across a hotel ballroom stage. For the climax, we all filed out of the ballroom and into the parking lot, where we would prove to ourselves we could do anything we put our minds to by walking across a bed of hot coals. Yeah, so apparently this is a thing in the motivational speaking world, or certain parts of it. You would be told that what's holding you back from succeeding is your mindset, and walking barefoot across hot coals would be the key that unlocks the prison of these self-imposed limitations. When it was my turn to walk, I was exhausted after a long day of visualizing, but I took off my shoes and socks, I did my power move, a kind of superhero pose we had all come up with earlier to get us in the right frame of mind, then I imagined my feet bathed in something cold, like tree moss after an autumn rain, and then I walked, briskly, as instructed, while saying over and over the words, cool moss, cool moss, cool moss. Yeah, I know. But before I knew it, I had crossed the whole row of simmering coals. I was victorious, unburnt, unstoppable, a champion. To be clear, we weren't told this was some kind of miracle of mind over matter. While most of us weren't experts in the limited thermal conductivity of coals on fast-moving feet, we did understand that tens of thousands of people with disposable income had been doing this in parking lots all over the world for years. We had to sign a waiver, and reportedly a handful, or footful, of people have ever gotten burned doing this, so don't try this at home. But essentially, this was just a $1,200 metaphor. The real lesson came the next morning, the final session, when our weekend guru left us with a sales pitch for the more exclusive and much more expensive seminar he was running later that summer. If we truly wanted success in life, we would sign up for it right now. He then pointed to a row of tables in the back, ready to receive us and our credit cards. And look, if I had had the money to spare, or the credit, I would have signed up. I was looking for all the answers. But the reality of my bank account was enough to snap me out of my weekend trance. The glow started to fade. And a week later, the glow had fully worn off, replaced by the same old self-doubt. Part of me thinks I was just lazy. I didn't apply the tools with enough diligence to turn my life around. Another part of me thinks I got scammed. But the biggest part of me imagines my Benjamin Franklin is still out there. I just have to find him. The bottom line is this. Instead of feeling like I could overcome any obstacle, I walked away from the whole thing with more evidence that I was broken. I suffered this disappointment in my 20s. For Horace Greeley, crippling disillusionment came much later but I imagine he got a taste of it in January 1856. 
That's where we're picking up Greeley's story. Since starting the paper in 1841, Greeley's profile continued to rise. Now, in 1856, seven years after taking a sledgehammer to Congress, now the House of Representatives was fighting itself again. This time, the tension was around selecting their leader for the new congressional term. You see, for two months, Congress was trying and failing to elect a Speaker of the House. Again, Greeley biographer Jake Lundberg. They couldn't settle on a Speaker because the political parties were so unsettled. The, the Republican Party was taking shape. Uh, the Whig Party had, had fallen apart. There were people in the Democratic Party who were opposed to the expansion of slavery in the West. There were people who had formerly been Whigs who were uh, identified briefly with anti-immigrant parties. And so there's this whole kind of shakeup. And how do, you, how do you find a speaker when there are all these people who are sort of uncertain of what their political home is? All this fracturing and confusion made it hard to get a majority to decide on a Speaker of the House. This would turn out to be the longest and most contentious Speaker election in history so far. It was a big news story, so Horace Greeley was there, partly to cover it, but also as a kind of influencer. Since his Whig party was collapsing, he had a stake in the founding of a new, mostly northern party, the Republicans. It's in the midst of all of this that he has this encounter with an Arkansas congressman by the name of Albert Rust. Encounter? What, what kind of encounter? There were fists and there was, again, yeah, there was some caning. <laughs> ah, the good old days. You see, the front runner and eventual winner of the speaker fight was an anti-slavery guy named Nathaniel Banks. Albert Rust, the guy who beat up Greeley with his cane, he was pro-slavery. Rust had proposed what he considered a compromise in the speaker fight. Greeley had condemned this compromise in his newspaper, calling it a maneuver to undercut the anti-slavery guy, Banks. Rust got a little angry at what Greeley printed. So after Congress adjourned for the day, he confronted Greeley on the Capitol grounds. Rust wanted to engage him in a duel. Greeley did not want to do this. And there were a couple of brief um, sort of attacks from Rust on, uh, on Greeley. One attack with his cane on the Capitol grounds and another brief attack with his fists on the Washington streets a few days later. I'm imagining this thrilling encounter in front of stunned onlookers. The Capitol Dome looming in the background as a dramatic metaphor. Democracy itself bearing witness. Well, if, if, if we're being cinematic about it, you'd probably make it that way. I, 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 can't, I can't guarantee that the Capitol Dome was, was in the background. What? Uh, okay. But, you know, there's, there's, there's tremendous sort of symbolic value to this. This is not the most famous caning that happened um, in 1856. In May of that year, a South Carolina congressman named Preston Brooks would cane Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the United States Senate in a, in a much more brutal uh, and protracted assault. So caning was in the air. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Caning with, with tremendous kind of sectional symbolism. Um, so, you know, Southerners caning prominent Northerners and prominent Northerners who kind of represented opposition to, to slavery. According to one Northern journalist, when Rust was arraigned in court for attacking Greeley, he, quote, appeared to glory in what he had done, unquote. If Greeley was trying to heal a divided nation, his medicine wasn't going down. In fact, the medicine, his newspaper, the Tribune, seemed to be causing an allergic reaction. But so far, Greeley was undeterred, writing, my business here is to unmask hypocrisy, defeat treachery, and rebuke meanness. And these are not dainty employments. Greeley urged his new party, the Republicans, to see themselves not as a northern party, but as a national party. Because the wealth generated by slavery was concentrated into the hands of only a few rich planters, Greeley believed most southern whites, who were not wealthy, they could be swayed. Once they saw the advancements in education and infrastructure and scientific agriculture the Republicans had to offer, these poorer Southern whites, these true unionists, would disavow this small group of wealthy secessionist planters and join the Republicans in a new united national effort at self-betterment. He's constantly looking for this moment when 
this true American nation that he thinks is there is going to be fully realized. And so these crazy secessionists are, are threatening to leave the union. Let's let them do that. Call their bluff. And when we do that, the true unionists are going to step up and we're finally going to have this nation that we haven't been able to have because there's this sort of small group of crazy people in the South. Yeah, a civil war happened instead. In the beginning, when the South started winning some battlefield victories, Greeley wrote a panicked letter to then-President Abraham Lincoln, urging him to make peace with the rebels at any cost. Again, this was near the start of the war. As you get into the kind of middle years of the war, the way that the true nation is going to be realized is through, you know, emancipation and the abolition of slavery. So Greeley writes another letter to Lincoln. Now, instead of urging him to make peace at any cost, he's urging him to get tougher on the South with emancipation, to make more of an effort at confiscating and freeing their slaves. But then... As you get into the later years, the way that the true nation is going to be realized is through being soft uh, on the South and forgiving to the people who led this rebellion against the nation. By now, Greeley had landed on his grand idea for reunification. First, no one, no man, should be prevented from voting even if they're a former slave. He called this impartial suffrage. And second, everyone in the South should be forgiven. He called this universal amnesty. And to show the South he was serious about this universal amnesty, Greeley did something bold. Horace Greeley, along with Cornelius Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, this super rich guy in the 1800s. Went and paid the bail for Jefferson Davis uh, in Richmond, Virginia in 1867. Jefferson Davis, the former president of the Confederacy, who was captured at the end of the war and was now awaiting trial for treason. This sounds kind of crazy and shocking now, and, it, and it, certainly, it certainly was then. But this was entirely in line with Greeley's vision for national realization and sectional reunion. So does he, he literally gets on a train with like a bag of money or is it his money or Vanderbilt's money? It's, yeah, Vanderbilt, I think, is, is the wallet there. And how much money are we talking about? $100,000. A little over $2 million in today's dollars. And it worked. Greeley hand-delivered the cash and Jefferson Davis was free pending trial. A trial never happened because a year and a half later, then-President Johnson pardoned all former Confederates. But for Greeley, he felt very powerfully that this was a grand gesture that was going to help to kind of spark this national reunion and really this kind of national realization that that throughout his life, he was always working for and, and imagining as being kind of right around the corner. What was actually around the corner? Angry letters, canceled subscriptions. One slavery abolitionist calls Greeley a fawning spaniel who made treason easy and respectable. Greeley fights back. And writes this kind of very defiant public statement saying that you people are so small-minded, you don't recognize that this will go down as one of the greatest gestures in the history of the world. You know how some people assume that because they feel a certain way about, I don't know, pineapple on pizza, everyone else should feel the same way? One publication pointed out this same flaw about Horace Greeley that he had, quote, an unfortunate habit of mistaking his opinions and sentiments for those of the nation. This is the flaw fueling his disastrous run for president. So let's get to it. The election of 1872. At first glance, running for president seemed like a ridiculous idea. Horace Greeley, the, the newspaper guy? But there was this slowly emerging counter-argument. Why not? The Civil War was now over, but the North and the South still didn't trust each other. But Greeley was, according to some, independent, incorruptible. Yeah, he was a Northerner, but his rhetoric was relatively sympathetic to white Southerners. I mean, the dude got on a train with a bag of Jefferson Davis's bail money to prove it. Plus, the guy was famous. I mean, why not put a celebrity in the White House? The idea seemed to get a little less ridiculous. 
So a year before the election in 1871, Greeley embarked on a grand speaking tour of the South. He imagines that the story of him going into the South and going around and meeting people and giving these speeches and making these appearances will be part of this, this kind of sectional reunion and national revival. There was a good bit of coverage of this, and it seemed to kind of reflect back to him precisely what he imagined. As he imagined, so it was that Southerners, white and black, came out in droves to see this great national philosopher. When Greeley spoke about the unfairness of post-war Reconstruction, many whites in the crowd nodded in agreement. For them, the world had turned upside down, with former slaves now voting citizens, the men at least. Even northern newspapers portrayed Greeley as conquering the South. So when he got home from the tour, Greeley pursued a formal party nomination for president. But here's where things get a little tricky. Because there wasn't a natural home politically for Greeley outside of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is out because, of course, the sitting president, Ulysses S. Grant, the hero general who had defeated the Confederate army and saved the Union, according to Northerners, the now President Grant is a Republican. And so he ends up in a very, very unlikely and unhappy marriage with this kind of offshoot party called the Liberal Republicans. The Liberal Republicans. They were this mixed bag of Northerners and Westerners who didn't like President Grant. They were sympathetic to Southerners who felt Grant's post-war Reconstruction policies were needlessly antagonistic. And they hated all the corruption in the Grant administration, as did many others. But the liberal Republican alliance with Greeley is weird because they didn't really like him either. But sort of succumbed to the idea of him as their candidate, even though it's a bad match for complicated reasons involving boring things like tariffs, Greeley ends up being their, their candidate largely on the strength of his public profile, celebrity, uh, and, and so forth. And in a season of strange alliances, this wasn't to be the strangest. In the summer of 1872, the Democratic Party, in this kind of unimaginable move, accepts Horace Greeley as their nominee. Yeah. The historically pro-slavery, Greeley-hating Democratic Party. If you're looking at the beginning of 1872, you would say that Horace Greeley would never, ever, ever, ever uh, be affiliated in any way with the Democratic Party. He had literally spent his entire political life battling against the Democratic Party. But for the Democrats, nominating anyone other than the very popular Horace Greeley would have split the anti-Grant vote. And maybe Greeley would end Reconstruction. So they also rolled the dice, grudgingly, and nominated Greeley. So he runs as both a liberal Republican and a Democrat. Greeley goes all in on campaigning, resigning his post as editor of the Tribune. But we know how the story ends. Greeley loses. While he won over some Democrats, many still couldn't stomach voting for this Northerner they'd spent so long despising. And as for Grant, despite the corruption in his administration, the guy was still a war hero outside of the South. So after a brutal campaign where Greeley is relentlessly attacked in editorials and political cartoons, Greeley only won six states. His was the biggest popular vote lost by a major party candidate in nearly four decades. It was a crushing failure. But by the time he got these results, Greeley had just suffered another great loss. Greeley had actually stopped campaigning in October, a month before the election, because his wife, Mary, was sick and getting sicker. Despite their differences, Greeley still needed to be at her side. And that's where he was when she died on October 30th. After losing his wife, then losing the election a week later, Greeley was despondent. The campaign and the defeat really invalidated sort of who he thought he was. Kind of his entire life falls apart. He came back to the Tribune, but only for a few days. In the eyes of the paper, he was now a national embarrassment, a liability. And Greeley quickly learned about a movement to unseat him as editor. It's just clear that he no longer has the kind of status and stature that he had before. He also had 
far less power because he had sold many of his shares in the Tribune. He had very little money left. He, he can't go back to being what he had been. About a week after the election, drained, grief-stricken, unable to sleep, he took out a piece of Tribune letterhead, crossed out the logo at the top, and replaced it with the words, Out of the Depths. Underneath this, he wrote, I stand naked before my God, the most utterly, hopelessly wretched and undone of all who ever lived. I have done more harm and wrong than any man who saw the light of day. It goes on like this for 15 pages. If, like me, you've ever thought of yourself as a worthless failure, then this letter by Greeley, this literary nervous breakdown, it feels very familiar. He concluded the letter by praying for God to take him out of this world. His prayer would soon be answered. A week later, Greeley was committed to a sanitarium in the ironically named town of Pleasantville, New York. His doctors called it a nervous prostration. He couldn't recognize the names of friends. He was acting even more bizarre than usual. By some reports, this wasn't the first time Greeley had lost it, but it would be the last. On November 29, 1872, just 24 days after losing the election, 30 days after losing his wife, Horace Greeley died. He was 61. The United States has a very interesting form of nationalism in the sense that we have incredibly robust language and practices associated with our, with our nationalism, and yet it's very fragile and sort of incoherent at the same time. Greeley is sort of a, a reflection and representation of that. Fragile and incoherent might also describe the response to Greeley's death by the American public and the American media. Upon news of his passing, so soon after the election, publications quickly pivoted. Harper's Weekly, which had poked at Greeley mercilessly during the campaign with its political cartoons, wrote, Since the assassination of Mr. Lincoln, the death of no American has been so sincerely deplored as that of Horace Greeley. And he had a multi-day sort of uh, funeral uh, that was widely reported. Again, author Vincent DiGirolamo. A funeral uh, parade. It had like a, a hundred firemen, 50 policemen. It had, you know, 125 wagons, you know. And, I mean, his body was in the uh, uh, city hall in, in New York uh, on public display. And people came by. African-Americans came by to pay their respects to him as well. And, and then they lined the streets during the cortege down to the, uh, the cemetery. It was the equivalent of a state funeral for a public, a public uh, official. I'm sure a lot of this grief was genuine, but it was so widespread, and the platitudes in the press were such a 180 from the campaign, it started to tickle a kind of revenge fantasy of my own, imagining everyone who had ever humiliated me suddenly forced to participate in a public outpouring of guilt-fueled grief. But I digress. The Tribune would continue on under new management, eventually merging with the New York Herald in 1924. Later, the New York Herald Tribune folded in 1966. As for Greeley, not only did he fail at becoming president, he kind of sabotaged his whole life's work, achieving his vision of American nationhood. Out of Greeley's failure to kind of unify the country in 1872 comes a kind of successful model for doing that, that, that means the abandonment of Reconstruction, that means the abandonment of trying to make emancipation really mean equality and full political participation for former slaves. Greeley's campaign in 1872 sort of provides the script for that abandonment and retreat from Reconstruction. You know how sometimes, after putting together a piece of furniture, there's a bunch of random stuff left over? Screws? Wedges? You can't help but wonder if the whole thing will fall apart. That's kind of what happened after the country abandoned Reconstruction. Federal troops had been stationed in the South to enforce the hard-won civil rights of freed slaves. The withdrawal of those troops leads to a wave of violence and repression against those former slaves. 
the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, lynchings, loss of voting rights. Like me, after that fateful New Jersey weekend, America stumbled out of the election of 1872 with more evidence that it was broken. Special thanks to Vincent DiGirolamo. He's the author of Crying the News, A History of America's Newsboys. And special thanks to Jake Lundberg, author of Horace Greeley, Print, Politics, and the Failure of American Nationhood. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in both books about the history of American media, how it intersects with politics. Definitely check them out. This podcast was written and produced by yours truly, David Sadzen, with dramaturgy by Dr. Shane Bro, additional support by Brian Waddell, and the invaluable feedback, patience, and encouragement of many others. Music by Artlist. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, tell a friend, leave us a review. Your word of mouth makes a big difference. Until next time, this is David Sadzen encouraging you to hug the biggest loser in your life, even if it's you.